Okay, well, we have a we have a full agenda today, so I'm going to get started one minute early. Um, hello and welcome. This is the UC Center Sacramento Speaker Series. I'm Richard Kravitz, director at the UC Center. Um, it's a pleasure to see such a robust audience here with us to address uh, this important topic today. For those of you who don't know UC Center Sacramento, we are a program of the University of California system with a dual mission of preparing California's future leaders and sharing knowledge in the interest of better public policy making. And fundamentally, we seek to improve quality of life for all Californians by addressing our state's big problems, housing, education, pandemic response, and yes, climate change and wildfires through education and dissemination of research. So here to help us do that are a distinguished pair of academics and an equally distinguished public servant, Patrick Wright, who will in a minute introduce our speakers for today. Mr. Wright is director of the Governor's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force. He's also acting director of the Forest Management Task Force of the California Natural Resources Agency and executive director at the Tahoe Conservancy. In his many past lives, he served as executive director at the California Bay Delta Authority, deputy secretary for policy development at the California Natural Resources Agency, and senior policy advisor to the regional administrator at the US Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Wright earned a master of public policy degree from UC Berkeley, and it's now a pleasure to introduce him to you. Mr. Wright. Thank you, Richard, very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to introduce our speakers and uh, provide just a little context to today's uh, session. Um, I think it goes without saying that the uh, in the state of California, our efforts to address uh, climate and in particular fire are undergoing very, very rapid transformation um, in many ways. First and foremost, we're scaling up across the board. As many of you know, uh, the governor of California and the, the federal director of the Forest Service last year signed an agreement to scale up our forest management projects to a million acres annually by 2025. That's a quantum leap forward in our efforts to try to get a handle um, on our forest health crisis. Um, secondly, we're rapidly trying to increase our level of partnerships to try to get to that scale. Candidly, a lot of the state, federal, local agencies have been working in silos, and we're now recognizing that we need to partner on a much bigger scale than we ever have before. Uh, the task force that I'm now leading is a great example of that. It's being transformed from a state-driven task force to one that's now going to be jointly led by state agencies, federal agencies, local agencies, and tribal agencies. And then third, and what's I think most relevant to today's conversation, is we're just seeing rapid advances in science and technology across the board um, that'll help us at every step of the process, from firefighters who want the latest technology that will help track and integrate fire and climate and weather and vegetation and topography data uh, to get a better handle on uh, the fire prediction to folks doing reforestation that might use drones and other technology to reseed thousands of acres um, to satellite imagery and artificial intelligence that's out there to help assess the health of our forest to identify the areas that are most high at risk so that we can really focus our investments where they need to focus. So a lot's happening in this field, but it's happening in a very scattered way, a very incremental way. And so uh, over the last year or so, a very distinguished group of scientists and leaders got together and said, you know, maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a way to accelerate this effort. Can we take a page from the medical community response to COVID where you've got scientists working side by side with agencies and the business community to partner to get these latest tools directly into the hands of land managers, decision makers, as we drive innovation rather than through scattered grants and initiatives across the state. So I'm very pleased today that we've got in front of us two of the leaders of that effort. Uh, Dr. John Battles from UC Berkeley, uh, who's a professor of forest ecology and is the co-lead of the Task Force's Science Advisory Panel. And Dr. Alex Hall from U UCLA, professor of atmospheric sciences, who leads the uh, UCLA 
uh, Center for Climate Scientists. Um, they are going to walk us through this very bold, uh, audacious idea, audacious idea that they've got. So I'm looking forward to a very spirited conversation today. Um, it's a new approach. It's one that candidly um, the agencies um, are welcoming, but have a lot of questions about. So uh, we're look looking forward to hearing from you and others as we go. For those of you who have questions and want to participate in the conversation, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We hope to use that to help uh, get the conversation going. Um, but in the meantime, I'll turn it over to John uh, to present the idea and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for the introduction. And Richard, uh, thank you for inviting us to come talk today. And as Patrick mentioned, Alex and I just really are the spokespeople for a much larger group of, of scientists and, and, and managers who have been talking about this informally for the last couple of years. Um, a lot of it grew out of many of us are participating in large research efforts. And, and we started talking about how we could make our research efforts uh, more effective and how we could share information and not you know, avoid duplication. And this kind of grew out of this idea that we, we needed to, you know, do we have the science and tools and policies we need to deal with climate change and in particular wildfire in California? Now, we start with a fact, and this is, this is well known, that the climate is warming in California. This is results from the California Fourth Climate Change Assessment. Um, and you know, here's, the, here's the historical record. And we see that even under the best sort of case scenario, that the resource concentration pathway of 4.5 in blue, which, which means we, we really get our greenhouse gas emissions under control, California is warming and will continue to warm throughout the millennium. So, so some of this response is baked in. We are going to get a warmer climate. And if we fail to sort of meet our goals in terms of emission targets and you know, decarbonizing our economy, we're gonna be at this red line. So it, it, it's not a matter of, of no climate warming, it's that we are gonna get climate change. It's just a matter of how much at this point. And so we really need to address the, the multi-dimensional aspects of how warming climate affects all parts of California life. And, and in this case, as, as Patrick mentioned, one of the most pressing has been its effect on, on, on wildfire and also the interaction with drought. So, we, we, what we're seeing, and we're, we're seeing this in real time in the last decade or so, this phenomenon of mega fires and hot droughts, and, and they're, they're certainly linked together, um, and they're also linked to the changes in climate that we're seeing. Again, you know, as, as has been well reported, uh, 2020 was a disastrous year in California for fires in terms of area burned, but not only was the area burned, but it was just the absolute, the overwhelming size of the fires that, you know, um, something like seven of the top largest fires of all time happened in 2020. And this, you know, this August complex fire, which was the biggest fire last year. Um, you know, for me, I put it in the area, it burned the area of, of Glacier National Park. So basically that fire footprint would cover the entire Glacier National Park. Um, and this is, but this is not an exception. If we look through the longer term market and we average the area burn um, by in five year increments, we see that there's just been this, you know, quite steady increase in, in just the amount of wildfire that's happening in California. And so we're getting bigger fires, we're getting more fires um, throughout the century. And again, this is not limited to California. This is an infographic from the New York Times that shows wildfire trends in the American West. So this is the fire prone regions of the American West, starting way back in 1950 with a total annual you know, area burned in, in um, square miles. And you can see that there's again, a, a, this red line is a five year rolling average. And you can see it's just been increasing through time, particularly since 2000. And of course up here, 2020 was an exceptional year, not just in California, but across the American West in terms of the, the area burned. And so it's, 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 a, it's a California problem. It's a, a regional problem. It's, uh, you could argue it's gonna be a fire prone. It's, it's any fire prone region in, in the globe is gonna be experiencing these kinds of changes. And so it's just an imperative that we, we get a handle on them. And of course there's, you know, with wildfire in particular, the, the cost to the environment um, are, are well established, but there's also a, a really, of uh, compelling human costs. There's, there's lots of lives. Um, there's lots of property of homes and businesses. And then in particular, this last year, we also had this, we, we had a sort of a, a socialization of the emissions from wildfires throughout the state. Um, this is a picture during, um, you know, during the Creek Fire uh, in September 9th, where much of the Bay Area was, this is 10 o'clock in the morning down at, this is a picture of Merritt Lake down in Oakland, California, which you have these red skies, um, this almost apocalyptic Seen. And this is all because of wildfire emissions um, that we, we, you know, all of the state experienced this year. 
In addition, and related to the changes in the climate that are happening, they're driving wildfires. Um, we also have um, we are also having hot droughts. Now, again, California is 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 a is, is a droughty climate. It's been droughty for, for the past you know three or four millennia, so that's not surprising. But we have a change because of the warming that's that's affecting it and and, and, and making drought conditions even worse. So this is a nice graph that came from uh, colleagues uh, Mike Goulden and Roger Bales, where they took in, in these gray bars. These are Precipitation, annual average precipitation since 1985, and they superimposed, uh, you know, and you can see that's a uh, scaled here, and they superimposed the average annual air temperature, um, this this red dotted line, and 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 looked at how droughts in the past compared to this most recent drought, the 2012 2015 drought, and what you see is you know back in this 1990 drought that again drought is defined by an absence of precipitation, a, a, a severe limitation in precipitation, and we had one of these classic multi-year droughts ongoing. But the air temperature was was moderate. It wasn't that bad. It was so we, we were we had an absence of supply in terms of precipitation, but we didn't have these high energy needs, these cooling needs that that because the temperatures were also moderated. And what sent uh, what sent this 2012 2015 apart and made it exceptional within California's record was not the fact that we had four dry years in a row, although they were extremely dry, but we also had some of the highest temperatures we've ever seen at the same time. So you have these hot dry droughts and these put incredible, I mean, not only these sort of supercharge uh, fire weather, they also put incredible stress, uh, not only in our natural ecosystems, but, but you know, our agriculture and cities in terms of demands for water. Um, in terms of the forest, you know, we have really good evidence that this hot drought um, not only killed trees directly, but also triggered or weakened the trees to an extent where native bark beetles could attack trees at just at unprecedented rates. So we had this, this massive mortality event across the straight state. You can see it happening. This is sort of a, a, a time-lapse graphic showing annual average, annual predictions of, of mortality by the Forest Service. Um, you can see it happened throughout all the forest regions of the state, but it was definitely concentrated in the Southern Sierra and out of the driest parts to begin with. And the scope of this mortality is, is, is diffuse and that is it's spread throughout, uh, but there's, you know, in some cases we have 60, 60 to 70% of the conifer trees are dying. And you can certainly see this is a picture down near Yosemite National Park. So some of our, 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 our most cherished um, reserves have, have been attacked by this. Um, and, and this is a huge consequence in many ways to forest health, but the link to wildfire is that you create this huge influx of large surface fuels as these dead trees fall. And so all, you know, again, fire is based on, on really you have to have an ignition source, you have to have fuels to burn, and then you have to have sort of, you know, the oxygen and the winds that, that drive these patterns. And so this one key uh, apex of the triangle of, of, of fire risks, we all have this huge and, and unprecedented influx, influx of, of large, uh, you know, long burning fuels. And it's, it's, it's extensive throughout, in some parts, it's extensive throughout the state and sometimes concentrated. So we could get these large impacts of fuel that, that as these dead trees fall. And the concern is, and this is really a major research gap, is that, does this new fuel distribution create a new kind of wildfire regime? All of a sudden that, you know, it's all about, we have these large, usually when we think of these catastrophic fires, we, we're, we're worried about crown fires, ones that are, are spreading through the crown, um, they're burning canopies um, in, in, in the tops of the trees, and they're these fast moving crown fires that, that were so, you know, that were, that is, that are so damaging. Um, this is a entirely different kind of fire where it could potentially ignite this, this large mass of homogeneous fuel um, that's underneath these forests and it will smolder um, and creep along and, and, and burn for potentially weeks or months um, with the potential if it gets enough heat to become a crown fire, become kind of a mass fire event. And so a lot of it comes down to the, so how much wood is there? And, and, how, and in particular, you know, how is it spatially distributed? So th these are kinds of questions we haven't dealt with in terms of the fuel distribution. And then also how does, and it's getting right back to the beginning of fire physics is like, how does this kind of fuel actually burn in a wildland system? And so the, again, the state has funded a, a couple of very large efforts to try and understand this, you know, as part of their missions so of the Pyrogens Consortium and the Center for um, Ecosystem Climate Solutions are both working on this. And we have some of the best minds in the state working on this, this is uh, Daniel Foster. He's a, a PhD student who, who is, you know, one of the key things for these models uh, for, for understanding this is to understand the distribution, the spatial, the detailed spatial distribution of these fuels. That, that just requires a whole new way of thinking about how we measure these aspects in the woods and then how that translates up into to wildfire behavior. And what does that mean for fire management in the state going forward? 
Um, another key aspect of it, and I would say it's probably the most uncertain aspect of, of wildfire prediction, are winds. You know, these are the driving winds that the, both the, the intensity of the winds and, and, and whether they're, they're wet or dry winds makes a huge impact. This is a satellite feed from November 5th to 15th in 2018. This is when we had the campfire ignite as well as the Wolseley fire in, in Southern California. And what this time-lapse event is showing is, is the development of these, these dry offshore winds that come on California. And you can see with these cloud patterns, you know, driving across, and you can see here now we're on November 11th, um, November 12th, this, this huge influx of clouds, you know, uh, clouds spreading across the landscape, being driven by these winds. So being able to predict and anticipate these winds and, and, and feed them into our, our, our efforts to, to prevent, you know, to manage fires, to, to be proactive about it. You need to model them. And this is some of the work coming out of um, um, the California Ecosystems Future, which is another uh, UC Lab Fees grant where they're trying to, to model these winds. And this is a complicated graphic, but the two, and this again, this is for the same time period in November 8th to, to 15th um, in, in, um, uh, uh, in November, 2018. And so the key thing is to look at this, this gradient here, this color gradient, this is a relative humidity gradient with brown being very dry, down like 7% relative humidity. That's the dryness of it. And the streamlined winds here are the, um, the, the darkness of them gives you the, the intensity of the winds. And as this goes through and clicks through the days, you can see it developing in here, um, a very dry um, uh, dry onshore winds that'll come. And again, you'll see them igniting down here in Southern California. Again, this was really driving this. The, I think there were three or four mat large fires that got ignited down in Southern, the Wolseley fire being the, the biggest among them. And so we're, we're making progress on these models um, in terms of simulating them because this matches sort of the satellite record of this, but trying to get fine scale topographic effects, the kind of at the, at the, at the, at the scale so that fire managers and equipment operators and, and, and PUC operators can to make decisions to, to prevent wildfires. Um, we also don't know how, these are, these are climatically driven winds, um, but we don't know how they, as, as a fire gets going, especially a large fire, it creates its own wind pattern its own winds, it starts getting huge thermal differences that can also affect the wind. So how does that influence the fire itself on winds? Then of course, this, we come back to this all the time, you know, how will the continual changes in climate affect wind behavior? So how, how do we get on top of that? So this is another, again, this is another major gap in our, our research understanding is, and it's critically important, uh, again, to, to understand the winds are doing to understand what the wildfires are doing. Another aspect, uh, that's been happening with, again, the, the changes in climate along with their effects on, on wildfires is that we, we've changed the, the, the regeneration, we've changed the vegetation dynamics of these future forests. These, these more severe fires um, where they kill 80 to 90% of the overstory trees um, it provides a huge opportunity for other, you know, for the shrubs to get established. And, and how does this, how does the recruitment of, of trees happen in these, these dense shrub fields where there might, might not be a, a parent to provide seed sources um, to, to, to start these trees. How does that happen? What is the process for this? We need to rethink our, our, our vegetation dynamics to understand how these forests change in the future um, under these novel conditions, both novel wildfires and also a, a different climate. The climate is warmer. It's gonna to continue to get warmer. It's gonna be drier in some places. So uh, how do we get a handle on this? Um, and again, we're, we're working on that. We're, we're trying to build fire vegetation models so that can account for the pace of climate change. Um, Dr. Polly Biot is a, a postdoc, um, again, working on um, a UC lab fee supported project. And what she's trying to do is she's, she's again, she's, she's trying to make models that both account for future increases in climate change and also what are the responses of the vegetation when you have fire or not fire and then simulate that across, um, you know, sort of the, the forested regions of California. Um, so it's an extraordinarily challenging bit. This is coming and a lot of this work is being done out of the Climate Change and Ecosystem Dynamics Lab at UC Berkeley. Um, and, and how do you, you know, with a lot of support from the Lawrence Berkeley Labs as well. So how, how do we build these models? You know, we have, to, we have to make them so they're reliable. These are projects, again, these systems project what the, the future is gonna like, you know, 50, 100 years in the future. That's the way, that, that's the time scale of force. You know, can we keep pace as climate change gets worse, as the fire regime changes? We need to keep updating these models um, so we have an understanding of, of where we're going and, and, and what, what, what policy and management solutions are, are, are available to us. Uh, you know, these are some of the basic science questions that we're wrestling, but there's also huge policy challenges um, that, that have still, there's some uncertainty perhaps in the science and applied science, but they, they largely come down to how do we as a society deal with them? 
Um, you know, this one is who gets the smoke. Um, you know, we certainly know that wildfires, you know, have huge, a lot more emissions and they're also regionalized. Clearly, uh, you know, towns and people close to the fire get the brunt of it, but then they're, they're, they're distributed throughout the state. Um, and we, so we have some, you know, one of our responses is to reduce fuels um, to, to prevent these wildfires. And there's, there's options here. There's mechanical treatments where we have heavy machinery going in and we, we thin and masticate with these heavy machinery. Um, these limit, these have limited emissions from the machinery, um, you know, but they're expensive. They, they cost a lot of money. And there's some opposition to having this kind of mechanization in some of our forests. Um, and they don't scale quite as well. Where prescribed fires are much more efficient. They're, they're probably more ecologically uh, palatable uh, in terms of their effects. Um, and they're, they're much more, they're cheaper. So you can cover more area um, for a less per, per acre cost, but they do create local emissions. And, you know, and so the communities nearby will get local emissions while you know, the, more, you know, the, the far away places in the state are, 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 are saved from these regional emissions. But this is a, a huge environmental justice question, you know, it's, and it's a guiding principle of how the state is going to respond to climate change. So we have an imperative to protect the lands and the communities together. And so that, that's a policy question. Um, of, you know, how do we, you know, how do we do these trade-offs um, between you know, who gets the risk, who gets the reward, who pays the costs? Um, and so these are questions we have to wrestle with, I think, as a, as a, as a, as a state. Another, you know, key, uh, challenging policy challenges is to, you know, how do we balance sort of um, wildfire hazard and wildlife habitat? Um, you know, clearly, you know, this is an example from the Southern California chaparral, the kinds of treatments we use to, to minimize fire behavior or to protect ourselves from these, these very damaging chaparral fires. You know, we can, again, it comes to this trade between prescribed fire, um, which is in, in mastication. Again, prescribed fire has some has some risks to it um, and, and some advantages. And domestication also has some, you know, it's a more controlled approach, but they have impacts on, in particular in this case, a paper by Newman and colleagues shows that, you know, prescribed fire does a much better job of retaining both bird composition and bird diversity in the chaparral, where some of these mastication treatments, um, we, we can reduce bird diversity and also switch around the, the composition of, of the birds there. And this is, an, this is just an example from Southern California, analogous sort of situations in, in the Sierra Nevada, where you have endangered species like this California spotted owl and the Pacific fisher that require sort of dense, um, high fuel hazard, you know, high wildfire hazard uh, forests for their prime habitat. So how do you balance those, these questions are, are, are really a challenge. And again, I think we have a good handle on the, on the sort of science applications of these, but really very difficult policy challenges. Um, another difficult uh, uh, policy challenges is how to protect uh, the wild and in the wild and urban interface from wildfire. Uh, you know, a really good paper from, from Anu Kramer came out where they looked at, and within California, they looked at sort of the risk of wildfire for these sort of different aspects of the, of the California landscape, you know, where clearly wildfire risk are, are to, to people, to their homes and, and, and towns is much lower in, in rural areas and, and, and wildland places, and certainly also lower in urban places. And one here, there's just a lack of people, and here there's a lack of fuel. Uh, but then we really went into problems in the, in the wild and urban interface. And, and they recognized two different kinds of, of, inter, of, of wild and urban um, interface. There's interface zone where you have communities that, that don't really have much fuel within the community, but they're, they abut wildlands that do have lots of fuels. And then this intermixed zone here where you have, you basically have, you have, it's more of the sort of suburban the landscape where you have houses and fuels mixed together. The interesting part from Kramer's paper was that, of course, you know, reiterated the fact that the Wu experiences most of, of, of the damage, in this case, um, homes and buildings being burnt, um, but the interface was, was, was actually kind of for a much larger share. And so there's, we have a whole host of policy solutions out there from some of the obvious ones, which is, you know, building codes for, 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 for wildfire hardening with, with financial support for, for, for individuals and communities that can't, can't pay for them. That's like, that's kind of, seems like a, a no brainer. To ones that tread on much more difficult political ground, for example, land use and development codes, um, restrictions on where people can build and fire wildfire hazard areas. That's a very challenging question. Two other questions that depend on third, prop, third parties, institutions like fire insurance could play a really dominant role in, in what happens in the, in the WUI area. So, so how do we get a grasp on, on those kinds of, of policy questions? And, and how do we bring people together to, to kind of bring the best minds together? I mean, we've often heard that the response to the climate change really needs to be in all hands on deck. We need all talents. We need all resources 
to be working in the same way. You know, one of the problems, so I think, you know, what we've seen, again, this is scientists and, and some of this slowness, this is the slowness of the science solution pathway is actually our fault. You know, we're sitting there working in the basic research area. Perhaps we also do some applied research. This is where, you know, our bailiwick, um, and it happens kind of in sequence. So it does have kind of this linear process. And then sometimes there's a, you know, potentially a, a tech transfer where we take our applied research and you know, that is able to get to be scaled up, um, you know, through the use of technology to, to, to be more broad than just our, our, our research areas. And then, you know, even less often are we involved in this, uh, you know, to decision support where these high-end tools get down to, as Patrick said, the, the people on the land, the regional groups that are, that are trying to make decisions. And it's, it can be, it's a slow science to solution pathway in part because of the linear nature. And it's also kind of a trade-off of, of different researchers and different groups who are, are facing these questions. So it's more like a relay race where we're handing things off um, in a linear fashion. And so it can take a decade to get us, you know, to go from basic research to a, de a decision support to a solution. Um, and that's really where this idea of the Climate and Wildfire Institute, uh, are, it's really a partnership, again, uh, among, among all participants to try to speed the pathway. You know, and, and, and the idea here is that there's still this kind of fundamental sequence where you need to have the basic science before we can do the applied research, before we can do the tech transfer, but rather than doing them in sequence, we do them, we do them in parallel. Because we start the basic research, and then, but then we're already thinking about the applied research and we're taught, this decision support person is involved in the earlier phases. So we don't get a decision support tool that's not useful or not addressing the challenges. And you know, once we go through one of these cycles, we speed them up and then there's this iteration and we're not quite sure we, we can start at any other place in this, in this parallel, parallel effort. Maybe we need to refine the tech transfer. Maybe we need to go all the way back to basic research. We go, we go to where we need, but we're able to reiterate this much faster. So you could think of where that, you know, the, this pathway from, from science to solution, we can get three iterations in a decade rather than just one and, and hopefully, you know, and, and, and speed this up. And so we've been proposing again, talking to a lot of colleagues is this Climate and Wildfire Institute. You know, we've talked about it as a partnership. Another idea, way to think about it is as a boundary organization um, that really pulls together the strengths of, of existing organizations, existing efforts. And, and really the Institute provides the infrastructure to knit these ideas together, to fill gaps, to be nimble in responses to emerging needs. So I think if there's anything we learned about climate change is that we're gonna be surprised by what comes faster. So you know, rather than having to, Oh, we're all of a sudden we have this big need and we have to scale up all of this. We have to start from scratch to scale up this brain trust and the solution pathway. We have it ready to go and we can just call on it and redirect perhaps to re-aim it, but we still have that infrastructure built together. Um, and so, you know, we've outlined some of our priorities here. I mean, again, we're, we're this is a, a it, we're in the process of doing this and we certainly don't have all the answers, but I think, you know, we do have some key priorities that have come up. Uh, one for sure is to is really to build capacity. We just have to build this capacity by co-developing knowledge. This is the idea of the of the parallel of the you know the parallel pathways. And we need to sort of integrate the, the traditional ecological knowledge that, that many of our in, indigenous um, tribes have. How do we build in their again? I say millennia of cultural experiences managing these fire prone ecosystems. You know, we need to learn from them and work with them to 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 find solutions. Um, you know, we need to work across all the different institutions involved here, you know, from here's one where we're working with the Forest Service. You know, again, bringing the Forest Service from, you know, the, a lot of these decisions in the Forest Service are made at the Ranger District level. So how do we get those kind of solutions? And when, you know, this partnership that Patrick is, is talking about, how do we make that work when the decision authority has been always siloed, you know, between private and public lands? How do we get those to work together? Because, you know, on our landscape, they often abut each other. You know, in, in parts of the central Sierra Nevada, we have this, you know, we have one township is federal, one township is private. How do we, do we, you know, fire doesn't look at property boundaries, neither does climate change. So how do we work together to take their, you know, again, build on what the forces are doing and, and merge it with the state. You know, here's an example. I, I like this picture. This is from Mendocino, a fire safe council meeting. Amir Maeda is a, a, a graduate of our program at UC Berkeley. She worked for the Forest Service and now she's the lead for the fire safe council in Mendocino County, working with, you know, again, uh, county supervisors and, and CAL FIRE to figure out how do they make Mendocino County safe? You know, and, and how do we get tools into these people's hands and make sure we know what their concerns are? Um, you know, building the uh, infrastructure for prescribed fire, we need to do a lot more of it. You know, so how do, we, how do we do the training for that? How do we make sure we support that as it goes forward? So this, we really need to co-develop knowledge as, as we go forward and that everybody, again, in a, working together. Another key part of, of thinking about climate change 
in general and wildfire in particular in California is that we need to have regional solutions. California, this is an example of there, you know, this is the bioregions. California is a remarkably environmentally diverse state, it's a large state, and it crosses many climatic gradients from, from north to south and east to west. And, and so we have a whole, you know, we, again, we go from, you know, from the, some of the most barren landscapes in the world to some of the most productive landscapes in the world, from the Mojave Desert to the Redwood Forest. And so these bring up, these present different, they're going to, climate change is going to, the response to climate change is going to vary by region. And if we focus on wildfire, we have large parts of the state that share very high wildfire hazard, but the fire regimes differ in these wildfire hazard zones. So, you know, the, the high wildfire hazard in Sierra Nevada is very different fire regime and we, we, we need different solutions as opposed to Southern California chaparral or the coastal or the central coastal redwood forest, the Northern coastal redwood forest. We need to have these, we need to have the solutions that, 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 that match the, the, the fire in, in biogeographic regimes. And of course, we also have many different communities, both historically across California and, and contemporary. And so no solution is gonna work without buy-in from, from society. Uh, well, the long-standing solutions mean we have to have buy-in. To this is not going to be an overnight solution. There's going to be very difficult trade-offs. Some of these policy questions that I mentioned are going to require trade-offs, and, and and to get people on board um, that these trade-offs are in everybody's best interest, and that the that the the benefits are shared and the costs are shared equ equitably among people involved. And so this is why we have to have regional. We can't have a statewide solution. We can have statewide leadership. That's essential. Um, but we don't, we need regional, you know, we need to have regional solutions to regional challenges. And again, one of the things that I think this came out of, of, of these big group meetings that started this whole process, we started trying to chart, you know, all of society's needs, you know, in blue here on the outside, you know, these are things that everybody can get on board of. We want clean air, we want resilient built environments, you know, we want healthy human populations, we want healthy forests, um, we want to share these you know, we want these style needs. And so what do we need to develop? What, what capabilities do we need to develop? Um, and as we were going through this, you know, I could put a whole bunch of arrows, but really one of the gaps is this coordination effort. How do we coordinate? And there's some shared services that many research groups and many sort of along the science of solution path, but whether having each group build that, we can build an infrastructure that's able to integrate and coordinate at ongoing efforts, not replace efforts, but to, to leverage ongoing efforts to make them more effective, to support them in certain areas. So this integration and coordination is, is a key priority of, of this idea of this science and uh, this climate and wildfire institute. Again, as I mentioned before, the support for the CWI you know, is, is widespread, so certainly within the, the science community. And these are the researchers who we, I think we've been, you know, it's sort of been the, the guiding counsel, if you will. Um, but also there's a lot of, you know, there's many more members in these, you know, as we started out, we have these very large, you know, current large research efforts related to climate and wildfire in California, um, where, again, a lot of the ideas have, have bubbled up from these efforts that are trying to, to you know, a lot of them are geared directly towards solutions um, and, and how we do that. And so I think, you know, again, we're trying to build support uh, throughout all of the, all of our colleagues and as well as all of the people involved uh, institutions and, and people involved in, in addressing these issues. And we're trying to coordinate and integrate those efforts. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, and I think now we can, you know, we have a robust time for, for questions. Um, 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 Wonderful, uh, thank questions. you so much for a fantastic presentation, Dr. Battles. And so I'm gonna go ahead and just pause for a sec here so that Brooke can go ahead and stop our recording.